And now I will introduce conference co-chairs Mark Meckler and Lawrence Lessig. Thank you, David, David Siegel, who has, along with uh, my assistant, uh, um, Selena Gray and Joey Mornin done an extraordinary job in pulling together a vast array of volunteers and all of you to this convention. So I'd like you to for, conference. Sorry, we're not at a convention yet. Um, I'd like you to join me in well and thanking them for their extraordinary work. So this is a conference about the question of calling a constitutional convention under Article 5 of our Constitution. It's a conference comprised of people who don't necessarily agree that a convention is wise or necessary. It's a conference comprised of people who don't necessarily agree about anything except that we are American citizens and we have a duty to pass to our children a republic as inspiring and profound as the republic we inherited. And many of us are fearful that we won't have that ability unless we focus serious attention as citizens upon what has happened to this republic and how to make it better. Now, Article 5 maps an ordinary procedure for amending the Constitution, and indeed every amendment to the Constitution so far has been brought about by that ordinary procedure. Congress proposes an amendment if two-thirds of Congress agrees, and the states ratify that amendment if three-fourths of the legislatures of those states agree. But as David suggested, the framers recognize that there might be times when Congress is not capable of proposing the kinds of amendments that the nation needs. So, an amendment like the 26th Amendment, which lowered the voting age to 18, is the sort of ordinary amendment which we can build political movements to support and Congress would have no need to oppose. But there are other changes which the institution itself might find reasons to block. So, whether one agrees with this change or not, the 17th Amendment gave citizens the right to vote for senators in their states, changing the original design which had state legislatures appointing senators to the, state, to the Senate. For many years, citizens, progressives, everyone pushed to see this change and Congress resisted it. And we came within one vote of the states calling for a convention before Congress got around to proposing that amendment and sending it out to the states for ratification. So that's an example of an amendment it's not likely the institution itself would support. We can think of others. For example, a non-controversial amendment that should be part of our Constitution that they would never support. Here's one. No public building or institution can ever be named after a living politician. <laughs> Obvious, right? <laughs> But never would politicians themselves support such an amendment. But there are others that are, of course, the subject of the profound questions that many of us here are addressing. Whether the framers should have given the president more power to excise bad parts of a bill, line item veto power. Whether the Congress needs a restraint, like a balanced budget requirement, to make sure that it doesn't lose fiscal responsibility whether we have better ways to assure that our elections are not dominated in the context of choosing representatives to Congress, whether any number of questions that might revisit fundamental structural issues about how our Constitution works, and then some, of course, prefer substantive changes to correct or to change decisions by the Supreme Court or evolution in judgment by Congress about how our country should be regulated. There's a wide range of issues. But when Mark and I talked about the idea of this, con this conference about the Constitutional Convention, what we understood was that the function of this conference was not to hash out 
the virtue or vice in any of these particular changes. Of course, people are free and will advance the change they think is necessary and therefore why a con uh, convention might be necessary to bring it about, but it's not our objective to run a convention. It's not our objective to run the debate that a convention would entail about the wisdom or necessity or virtue in any particular change. It's our objective in this one and a half day conference to facilitate understanding about the design that was inserted in Article 5 to, to allow the states to call for a convention for the purpose of proposing amendments, which then must be ratified in the same way by three-fourths of the legislatures of the several states or by conventions in three-fourths of the several states, however Congress may choose. Now, that's an important and difficult topic. But as David adverted to, and as Mark and I have talked about extensively, that's not the only important and difficult topic for us today. As important and as difficult will be to facilitate this conversation in a way that demonstrates the respect that I know exists among everyone organizing this conference and that ought to exist in the way in which we treat each other during the course of this conference. The respect recognizing people have different views, yet we are all citizens. And different views, working together as citizens, is what the republic was meant to frame. Republic, a representative democracy, to encourage differences to be worked out in this political way. And we have a certain freedom that other institutions in our society don't have. For example, we have no Nielsen ratings on this conference. <laughs> yeah, that's very important. We have no need to sell advertising to support this conference. We don't have to worry about whether what we say is so sexy or exciting or dramatic or mean or cruel or dramatic in a way that destroys the possibility of talking that people will tune in and want to watch. This is being recorded, it's being streamed, but I don't give a damn if there's one person on the other end of that line. That's not what's important here. What's important is the opportunity to talk about these issues seriously uh, in a way that advances understanding. And we need to remember that in the most important moments in the history of this nation, our forebears did this despite fundamental differences among them. When the framers gathered in Philadelphia to, as some say, illegally draft a, conven a constitution, they were not unified in their views about the right way to run a republic or about the values a republic should embrace. Indeed, there were slaveholders at that convention and people who thought slavery an abomination. And indeed, people like George Mason, who spoke most eloquently of anyone against slavery, yet himself was a slaveholder. This was a divided, fundamentally divided nation, but a nation that had the maturity to put aside even that difference long enough to have a conversation about how to frame a nation that could succeed because they saw the United States that had been born after the revolution was about to fail. Now there is no difference among anyone in this room as profound as the difference over slavery. We are not that far apart. And there is no need for anybody in this room to have the kind of moral indignation that people felt in the context of the our argument about slavery against anybody else in this room. We don't have to be as great in this sense as they were. We have to just practice the way to speak that we all teach our children every day. So I am extraordinarily honored to be part of this conversation, to facilitate this conversation, to help structure the people who will make it meaningful. And I'm extremely honored to share the stage with Mark Meckler. So as all of you know, Mark Meckler is one of the, is a co-founder of the Tea Party Patriots, the most prominent and in my view, the most interesting and ultimately will be the most important of the Tea Party movement. Meckler and I share at least one important characteristic. We both 
are fundamentally resolved never to become politicians and to facilitate citizens participating in a mature way to define and direct their democracy. I met Mark Meckler about 20 months ago. Ralph Benko introduced us. And we had a chance with Jenny Beth Martin to sit down and talk about what the Tea Party was trying to do. And from that moment, I think both of us have recognized that we each, though radically different in many views about what's great for this nation, each have the kind of love for this nation that I know everybody I know in this audience shares. So please join me in welcoming Mark to help introduce this event and welcoming, welcoming all of you to an event which I hope you will remember as the kind of discussion and conversation that America always needs. Thank you. Well, thank you for welcoming the Tea Party to Harvard. <laughs> I don't know if you saw some of the headlines that were out there, but there was one, my favorite was on Drudge Report said, Tea Party to descend on Harvard. And somehow I envisioned a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of our folks coming in with signs and protests. And I think that's, you know, that was the inflammatory headlines intent, right? And that's something that Larry was talking about, is this desire to inflame that exists in the media. And it's not only in the media, it feeds us as well as people. And we have been inflamed, and I think we've been inflamed against each other for a very long time. And I think there's a very good reason we're inflamed against each other, and that reason is that the politicians profit when we are inflamed against each other. And sometimes we're inflamed over very important legitimate issues. We have significant differences between ourselves as a society, between different groups in society, about the remedies for wrongs, about the amount of government there should be, the amount of taxes we should pay, whether we should be involved in war or overseas contingency operations, pro-life versus pro-choice, marriage and family, gay marriage, all these things are things where we have legitimate differences, where we need to have sometimes difficult discussions. But the politicians have realized that they can use these issues, the wedge issues, to intentionally divide us. If Democrats hate Republicans, if liberals hate conservatives, if pro-life hates pro-choice, marriage and family hate gay rights activists, and if we spend our time fighting each other, then the politicians can do what they want. They can do what they've always done since the beginning of the nation. They can do what our founders knew they would do, is they can consolidate their own power for their own benefit, often against the will of the people, and certainly against the good of the people. And the reason that I'm here today, and the reason that our organization agreed to be here today, is it's time to move past that kind of dialogue. It's time to move into a discussion. It's time to move into a common ground where we can fight against the politicians who want to take our rights away from us. When they take our rights away, when they invade our privacy, when they overreach with things like the Patriot Act, that doesn't affect conservatives, it doesn't affect liberals, it doesn't affect a, a single race or a single religion, it has an equal effect on all of us. It affects every citizen in the nation, both parties. And we really do have a two-party system in this country. It's part of the problem. Many people would tell you it's the Democrats and the Republicans. From my perspective, it's the incumbents versus the citizens. Those are the two parties we're facing in this country today. So we're here specifically to talk about the idea of an Article 5 convention. And one of the things that was very interesting for me as we started discussing this was that I received very negative reactions from people on the right about this and from people in the Tea Party movement. And I wouldn't say overall, I received a, a broad range of response. But there were some people who were pretty aggressively against the fact that I was going to come here and represent our organization. And that we were sponsoring this. And they said some things that I found very interesting and, and somewhat outrageous. I heard, and I heard this actually from both the left and the right, that I was coming into enemy territory. And I actually heard that phrase over and over. 
I had a reporter from the Boston Globe two days ago who warned me about the hostility that I would face in Cambridge. <laughs> and I find that outrageous. I haven't faced any hostility, first of all. And second of all, I told her, look, I looked at a map before I got on the phone with you. As far as I could tell, Cambridge is still within our borders. I'm an American citizen. That's not enemy territory. Whatever side of the political spectrum you're on, whatever your philosophy, your political ideology, we're countrymen, and we're countrymen first. And it's an extraordinary thing about American history that we came together from, from diverse backgrounds and throughout the country's history, immigrants have come from all over the world with a desire to become American, with a desire for those who, who want to come here today to be your countrymen, to share in this great American idea. And the idea, really, that is America is liberty. That's what we're talking about here. We have the liberty, thanks to the framers and the founders and the people who've given their lives ever since to protect that liberty. We have the liberty, if we so choose, to call a convention and amend the Constitution. Some would say a radical idea. Some on the right have told me that it will be a runaway convention. And I shouldn't be here because the convention can run away. And you'll hear from the right that we'll end up with a Marxist country. And you'll hear from the left that with the right seemingly on the ascension and those crazy Tea Partiers holding Congress hostage, that they're going to take away all our rights and there's going to be a state religion and there will be no freedom of speech for people on the left. I hear this craziness from both sides. And the reality is that I have faith in America and I have faith in you. You're American citizens. If we were to hold a convention, which I'm neither for or against a convention, but if we were to hold a convention, I have faith, the same faith that the founders had in you and in their own fellow citizens, that the debate would be reasoned. It would be heated. It was certainly heated at the Constitutional Convention, but it would be reasoned. And in the end, we would do the right thing. As the co-founder of the largest Tea Party in the nation, we have over 3,600 chapters across the nation. And yes, there's actually a chapter here at Harvard Law and at Harvard. As the founder of that organization, one of the founders, I get to travel all over the country. And this is the privilege, I get to meet with Americans all over the country. And when I started doing this, people, politicians would say to me, you'll be amazed because you're, you're going to meet ordinary Americans all over the country. And I've been stunned because I haven't met any of them. I've met only extraordinary Americans. I've traveled all over the world. And I, maybe this isn't politically correct to say today, but Americans are an extraordinary people. There's something inside the American DNA, and I think that something is a connection to liberty, a passion for this country and its history, and an understanding that there is a special spark of freedom here in this country that when it lit the fires of freedom here has spread since all over the world. And hopefully, if all of us take the responsibility seriously enough and do the right thing, we'll continue to spread that spark of liberty all over the world. And Larry talked about how we speak to each other. There's been some very, very heated rhetoric around the Tea Party movement. And it's been intense to be on the receiving end of that. And I'm just a regular guy. I live in the country in Northern California. I'm a practicing lawyer. I was before the Tea Party movement. I, I'm at home with my kids. That's where my practice is. Never intended to be a public figure. I agree with Larry, I will never run for public office. And I never expected to be in the spotlight. I certainly never expected to have people threaten to kill my family. I certainly never expected to have my phones tampered. I never expected to have people stealing and going through my garbage. I never expected the vicious emails we get every day. I didn't expect that stuff. And I'm not telling you this because I feel like a victim. I'm telling you because I didn't personally understand, it wasn't visceral to me, how deep the hatred was in this country. And I mean hatred. I'm not just talking rhetoric, I'm talking hate. Because of what I believe. I don't hate anybody because of what they believe, because of the thoughts that are in their head. You know, I didn't vote for President Obama. You might be surprised by that. <laughs> you also might be surprised to know that I don't like Republicans very much, and that in California, I'm what you call a declined to state voter. 
because I don't think they stand for any of us. I don't hate any of them, but they certainly try to teach us to hate each other, don't they? That's not where I come from. And I'll tell you, despite what you might have heard about the Tea Party movement, that's not where the Tea Party movement comes from either. I get to the opportunity to go on television and to talk about what the Tea Party patriots believe. And the way our organization works is it's not up to me what I say. It's up to the 3,600 local chapters across the country. Every Monday night, we have a meeting with these 3,600 chapters, and they tell us what the issues are for them, what's important to them, how to message it, and what they want us to do about it. If you see a nationwide protest, it's not because some smart people or not so smart people sat around a table and decided to do this. It's because these 3,600 leaders across the country came together and said, this is how we want you to speak. So they tell us, and I can tell you, regardless of your political ideology, they don't hate you either. They don't want to do horrible things to you. They don't want to do, as Andre Carson said, they don't want to see anybody swinging from trees. They're not racists. They're not homophobes. They're not horrible human beings. They're your fellow citizens. And I'm here to tell you that this is who they are. And part of my job is to go home and tell them who you are, who I met here at Harvard the extraordinary people I met from all across the political spectrum who all came together, who all set aside their fundamental differences to talk about the things they had in common in order to save this nation. And more than anything, I'm looking forward to this conference to learn from all of you who are here so I can take what I learn and return to my compatriots and the Tea Party patriots and to teach them about this America. Thank you guys for welcoming me to Harvard. I really appreciate it. Thanks.